Welcome to the introduction for Lab 11, which deals with gene expression. In addition to watching this video, you're going to want to uh, read the lab, lab manual and then also prepare your pre-lab. It's also going to be helpful to look over some of the tables and calculations that you'll be expected to do. We're not going to cover those in the video, but they're in your lab manual. And finally, it might be helpful to bring a laptop or have one of your group members bring a laptop because there's quite a bit of work that you'll be able to do during the lab. So gene expression. We can say that a gene is being expressed when the information in that gene is being transcribed and translated to make a protein. Now this uh, long line here on the diagram represents the DNA of an E. coli cell, a bacteria. And these boxes here are three genes, LACZ, LACY, and LACA, and they have something in common. The products of these genes are enzymes which are involved in the metabolism of a molecule called lactose. It's a sugar molecule that the bacteria can use for energy. All right, now even though there's three genes here, we're really just gonna focus on the first one, the LACZ gene. Now, we can draw a little symbol here to represent the place where transcription of that gene is going to start. So if this gene gets transcribed, and TS is my abbreviation for transcription, it's gonna be transcribed to make an RNA molecule and then translated by a ribosome to make a protein. And the enzyme that is synthesized here is called beta-galactosidase, or beta-gal. And we'll be talking a lot about this, but the LACZ gene encodes the beta-galactosidase enzyme. So there's this other important region of the DNA up here that we'll look at in more detail. And this is where the regulatory sequences are. So the questions we'll be asking in lab here, first of all, how do sugars regulate the expression of the LACZ gene? And how do mutations, changes in the DNA, alter the normal regulation? This molecule is lactose. And what it is, is a, a glucose molecule and a galactose molecule held together by a glycosidic bond right here. So, like any sugar, this can be used as an energy source for the bacteria. But there are a couple of uh, rules or guidelines that uh, determine how lactose is used by E. coli. So, first thing to keep in mind is that lactose is not always present. When it is present, it can be used as an energy source, but it's not always present. So, the next consideration is that genes encoding enzymes that metabolize lactose are only needed when lactose is present. For example, the, uh, the LACZ gene that we just talked about, um, it would be a waste of energy to produce those enzymes if there's no lactose around, because their only function is to break down lactose. And the final consideration here is that if both lactose and glucose are present, then it is glucose that is the preferred energy source. So if glucose and lactose are both around, the cell will utilize the glucose rather than starting to create all these new enzymes for metabolizing the lactose. All right, so here's a reaction that takes place inside the cell. Here's lactose, and that, uh, that bond between the glucose and galactose gets broken, leading to free glucose and free galactose, and this is the reaction that is catalyzed by this enzyme, beta-galactosidase. All right, now in lab, we're going to watch a slightly different reaction taking place. So in lab, we're going to use this molecule called ONPG, and that stands for O-nitrophenol galactose. And this, uh, the bond between the ONP and the galactose gets broken down to give us ONP and, and free galactose, and this is also catalyzed by the same enzyme, beta-galactosidase. Now, the reason why this reaction is useful for us in lab is that the ONPG molecule, this is clear, whereas the ONP molecule by itself, this one is yellow. So we'll be able to watch for this color change, and then we'll also be able to detect this yellow product using the spectrophotometer. All right, when you get into lab, you're going to start off by making a model of the LAC operon, or at least part of it. This rope represents a piece of DNA, and then here you can see this piece of paper represents the 
part of the uh, DNA containing the beta-galactosidase gene. So as discussed before, this is the part that gets transcribed and translated to make the enzyme beta-galactosidase, and it's beta-galactosidase that you're going to be analyzing in this lab. Now, next, I'm gonna, next thing I have to do is put on the regulatory DNA sequences. All right, so now the regulatory sequences are set up, and there's a card in lab that's going to help you and your group get this part set up correctly. Now we're going to imagine what happens in a wild type cell. So to get expression of the beta-galactosidase gene, the enzyme RNA polymerase has to be able to bind onto the DNA and position itself here at the start of uh, the beta-galactosidase gene to get expression. Now the interaction of RNA polymerase with the DNA begins here at this sequence called the promoter. And you can see the shapes here are designed to emphasize that the RNA polymerase and the promoter can interact. They have a similar shape there. Now, if nothing prevents it, RNA polymerase will then migrate along the DNA here to get to the beta-galactosidase gene and transcription will start. Now, there are also some genes that regulate gene expression, and those are these other shapes here. The first one we'll talk about is the repressor gene, or LAC-I. Now again, by looking at the, the shape of this, of this protein, you can see that it is, at this moment, able to interact with this sequence here called the operator. So there's a good binding between those. Now when the impress repressor is bound onto the operator, then the polymerase is physically impeded from moving across the operator region to the beta-galactosidase gene, and you don't get expression. However, if lactose is present, the conformation of the repressor changes. Notice how here it's got one shape. Here we have a different shape at the bottom showing that the conformation of this protein has changed, and that's induced by the binding of lactose. So now the operator can no longer bind onto the repressor, and the repressor is going to diffuse away. And now RNA polymerase is free to move across this region, and you get expression of beta-galactosidase. Now the other part of the regulatory picture is the catabolite activator protein, or CAP, and uh, it binds on to the promoter. Now, when the CAP protein is bound onto the promoter, then RNA polymerase is going to make an even tighter association with the promoter. In other words, RNA polymerase is going to bind to the DNA really well, and that is going to increase the chances of the beta-galactosidase gene being bound. However, when you look at this protein, you'll see that it really only has the right conformation for binding onto the active site when this other molecule, cyclic AMP, is present. And as you'll discuss in lab, cyclic AMP levels are uh, related to glucose levels inside the cell. Now, in the absence of cyclic AMP, again, there is a conformational change in this cap protein. And now the cap protein cannot bind onto the promoter. So in other words, you don't get that, in the absence of uh, the cyclic AMP, uh, you don't get that really tight binding of RNA polymerase to the promoter. So you still can get RNA polymerase binding to the promoter even uh, when the cap protein isn't bound on there, but it's not as strong as with the cap protein bound on. Now when you and your group get to lab, you're going to construct this model and go through what we just went through here, but then you're going to think about the effect of mutations. For instance, what happens if you change the sequence of the operator or remove it completely? What happens if you change the sequence of the promoter? So the sheet in lab is going to walk you through a bunch of different scenarios, and you're going to manipulate this model to think about what some of the mutant phenotypes might be. And always you're going to be asking the same question, is beta-galactosidase expressed or not? There's a lot of preparation to do before you get started. Now every table is going to have six of these flasks, and every student is going to get one flask. Now the color coding is important. The color of tape on top, this is the color for your table. So every table has a, a different color. The table, color of tape underneath tells you which sugar you're going to add. You're either going to add lactose, and this is color coded also, or a mixture of lactose and glucose. Now I'm just going to put the rest of these away and just keep number three out here because this is the one that I'm going to do. But remember, every student is going to have one flask that they're responsible for. Well, I can see that I need to add lactose to my flask, so I'm going to get one of these uh, color-coded tubes, and I'm going to measure out three mils of lactose there, and then I'm going to wait on that because everybody has to be ready to go before you add the sugars. Now over at the side of the lab are the different strains of bacteria. There's wild type, mutant X, and mutant Y. Now, the mutants, they have some uh, change at the DNA level that affects the expression of the beta-galactosidase gene. Now, I have sample number three for my table, and that means that I'm going to need mutant X. And so I'm going to measure out 27 
milliliters of mutant X. And then take this back to my table. All right, well, I've got my sugar measured out and I've got my 27 milliliters of bacteria ready to go, but I still have to label the tubes that I'm going to need because you have to do this at the start because once the reactions get going, you won't have time to get this all done. Now remember that I have uh, flask number three here and so I have labeled all of my tubes either 3B or 3C. And I've also added on the tubes the time. We're going to do a 0, a 20, and a 40 minute time point. And then for the C tubes, same thing, 0, 20, and 40. Now, there's just six tubes here, but these are only the tubes that I need. Everybody in the lab is going to need the six tubes labeled 1B, uh, 2B, etc., etc. So there's going to be a lot of tubes in here, and you've got to get them all measured out before you start. Okay, at the moment these tubes don't have anything in them, but all the tubes that are labeled B here, they need to get water. This is going to be the blank. And the tubes that have C in them, those are going to get this uh, stuff called ONPG. Of course, that's an abbreviation for a long chemical name, but this is the substrate for the beta-galactosidase enzyme. So if beta-galactosidase is being expressed by the bacteria, then it's going to react with this, and that's going to produce a color change that we can watch in the spectrophotometer. Now, each one of my tubes is going to need 200 microliters of either the water or the ONPG. So I've got my pipetter. I've set it for, uh, for 200 microliters here. And just a quick uh, review of the pipetter. You just need to tap the tip on. It doesn't have to be hard. Then to measure accurately, you're going to gently push down with your thumb, then pull out the sample that you need. There's 200 microliters of water and then go ahead and transfer that to your tube. And see that I'm putting the tip all the way down in the tube. I'm not trying to drop it up from high. So we'll do all of these. Now, I'm going to switch the tip when I'm done. And now my tubes of ONPG. Again, 200 microliters in each one of these tubes. Take your time and when you're done, it's good to give them a quick inspection just to make sure they all have uh, the same volume in them and that you haven't missed a tube. One thing that's tricky about this lab is you're going to have to keep track of a couple different times. So on the clock in the lab on the wall, you're going to want to note the time from when you add your sugars and then you're going to take time points every 20 minutes. But you're also going to need a stopwatch at your uh, table as well to keep track of the time of the individual reactions. Okay, we're finally ready to start got my tubes labeled and uh, they've got the solutions that they need in them. I've got my bacteria and my sugar ready to go. And everybody else at my table has done exactly the same thing with their uh, sets of tubes. Now another thing that's important to have ready to go is we need to have our bipedar still set at 200 microliters. And we also have to make sure we've got this sodium carbonate uh, solution which is going to be important later. All right, so now everything's ready to go. I'm going to check the clock on the wall of the lab and make a note of the time because now uh, the whole table together, and your instructor will tell you when to do this, is going to add your sugars to your bacteria. Then, quickly, you're going to use this. This is the one milliliter mark on your labeled pipette. You're going to take one mil out and put it into one of these little spectrophotometer cuvettes. And you're also going to take one mil and put them into the tubes labeled B and C. And of course, these are the zero tubes, the zero time point. Okay, now before I do anything else, me and the rest of the people at my table are gonna take these flasks and go put them in the incubator. Okay. I wanna open this up and put my sample in quickly so that the temperature doesn't change too much. We wanna keep this close to 37 degrees. All right, back from putting my samples in the incubator, but now it's so important that I start my stopwatch because now we're gonna look at the reaction taking place in these tubes. So I'm gonna close them and mix them up quickly. And then all of the tubes, mine and the rest of the group, are gonna go into this heat block where they'll be held at about 37 degrees. Now, you can't just put them in there and forget about them. You have to check them every minute or so. And what you're looking for is for the tube labeled C to turn yellow. That shows that a reaction has taken place between the ONPG and the beta-galactosidase enzyme. So some of them are gonna turn yellow right away within seconds. Others are not gonna turn yellow at all. But you have to keep checking uh, constantly every minute or so. Just take them out, look for any yellow color, and put them back in. Now, 
as soon as you do, let's say my, I pulled mine out and I noticed a little bit of yellow in here, I've got to stop that reaction quickly. The other thing I need to do is look at the time. So I'm going to stop my stopwatch and record that time. And now I'm going to add 200 or 400 microliters of the sodium carbonate, the stop solution. That will stop the enzyme reaction from happening. So there's 200, 400. This is denaturing the beta-galactosidase enzyme and preventing this reaction from continuing. 200, 400. I add it to both the tube C and tube B, the blank, because we want to treat them the same way. Now, once these have been mixed, then I can relax a little bit. These can be set aside and they won't change anymore until I'm ready to uh, later observe them in the spectrophotometer. So now it's time for one of the first measurements that we're going to do on the spectrophotometer. Remember, at the start of each time point, I uh, use my pipetter here to take one mil out of my flask and put it straight into this little cuvette. Um, the purpose of doing that is to detect how many bacteria are present here in the cuvette. So, of course, I'm going to want to wipe it off to make sure there aren't any fingerprints on it. And you'll notice that the cuvette can go in here two ways. Uh, you want to look for the side where there's the little clear window um, going right down the middle here. So the spectrophotometer gets blanked with water and then you put this in so that, that uh, the light will pass through that clear window and then you read the OD600 and that's going to give you an indication of how many cells are present in your tube. Of course over the time that you're doing the, the uh, experiment the bacteria are going to keep multiplying so it's important to calculate how many bacteria are in there uh, to get an accurate measurement of the enzyme activity. All right, looking at the clock on the wall, I realized that it's about time for our next time point. It's been about 20 minutes, so I'm going to get my tube B and C uh, with the 20 written on it and get those ready. And I've also got my, uh, my cuvette that's now been emptied out and cleaned uh, for testing the concentration of the bacteria. So now I go back to the uh, incubator to get my sample. So I've got my sample, and now I'm going to put one mil in the cuvette, one mil in each of the tubes B and C. I'm going to start my stopwatch again for the reaction time. Close these, mix these up, put them into the heat block here, and then I'm going to take my uh, flask back to put in the incubator. So now we're ready to determine how much of the yellow product was produced in each tube, and that's going to give us an indication of the enzyme activity. Now, I've waited until the whole experiment's done, and I've got all my time points here finished with the stop solution in them. You might have a chance to do some of uh, this step while the reaction is going on, but it's okay to wait until you're finished and then just analyze all the samples quickly. Now, for each time point, remember we have two tubes, one uh, labeled B and one labeled C. The B is the blank, and the C is the one that has the substrate in it. Now, you're going to have to transfer that liquid to these cuvettes uh, for going into the spectrophotometer. However, remember, there's that uh, small amount of chloroform, about 10 mils of chloroform, in the bottom of each of these tubes. We don't want to get the chloroform into these cuvettes because it will start to dissolve the cuvettes and it will make the readings not be accurate. So, you have to watch this very carefully. I'm going to use my pipetter here and I'm going to pull out approximately 500 mils of this, keeping the pipette tip far away from the uh, little bit of chloroform there at the bottom. And then I'm going to transfer that to my pipette. You can see that it's pretty much filled up to the top of this little window, so about 500 mils is enough for that. Now, this is my blank, so I'm going to put it in here, and I'm going to blank the machine. And while I'm doing that, I can get my uh, tube that had the ONPG in it, and transfer that in there. Now the machine's blanked, so I can go ahead and pull this out, put in my ONPG, and then I'm going to read and record the OD. Now it's important to remember also, when we were checking for the number of cells, this was set at 600 nanometers. For checking for that yellow product, it's at 420 nanometers. All right, when this is done, I can dump both of these out. Everything goes into the, uh, the used liquid containers that are here. So I'm going to dump both of these out, and then for the 20 minute time point, I have a new blank and a new uh, test tube. 